history of Jewish subversion in Spain could not be erased. There was too much evidence. Although they prospered under the Visigoths in Spain, they nevertheless conspired with Arabs in Africa to overthrow the Visigothic monarchy. At the beginning of the 8th century, they used their contacts with African Jews to prepare the invasion of the Mohammedan Berbers from North Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar. In 694, the 17th Council of Toledo proclaimed, quote, The impious Jews dwelling within the frontiers of our kingdom have entered into a plot with those other Hebrews in regions beyond the seas in order that they might act as one against the Christian race. In 852, the Annales Bertinianos described the loss of Barcelona because the Jews, quote, played the traitor, unquote, allowing the Moors to capture it. As a result, quote, nearly all the Christians were killed, the city was devastated, and the Jews retired unpunished. When the Mohammedans conquered Spain, the Jews flourished, achieving one of the most sophisticated cultures in Europe. The Jews excelled in medicine and helped in bringing Aristotle to Europe. When the Spaniards began the Reconquista, the Jews were not persecuted despite further acts of bad faith. Block quote. St. Fernando, on taking Cordoba from the Saracens, turned over four mosques to the large Jewish population to convert into synagogues and gave them one of the most delightful parts of the city for their homes on two conditions. That they refrain from reviling the Christian religion and from proselytizing among Christians. The Jews made both promises and kept neither. Even as Islam was rolled back to North Africa, the Jews continued to collaborate with Muslims. Spanish Christians were persuaded that the Muslim invader had been welcomed by the Jews and assisted by them, with all this implied for the national and religious life of Spain. The Judeo-Muslim symbiosis that characterizes most of the Arab occupation gives considerable plausibility to the Christian view that in these two communities, alien both in faith and at law, Christendom faced an unfriendly alliance. Much of the civil order in Spain was enforced through canon law, but Jews, because they were not Christians, could not be touched by that law. Quote, the laws against blasphemy, for example, could not be enforced against them. They could encourage heresy, and in defense could claim the freedom of worship granted to the Jews. Jews were therefore allowed to engage in many subversive activities with impunity, which caused resentment. The reign of Pedro the Cruel pointed out a paradox that would recur. The more powerful the Jews grew, the more precarious their position became. Tolerance led to violence against the Jews because the Christian majority felt that Pedro the Cruel had given his Jewish retainers control of the government and carte blanche to oppress them culturally and financially. Jews, Walsh reminds us, quote, were disliked not for practicing the things that Moses taught, but for doing the things he had forbidden. They had profited hugely on the sale of fellow beings as slaves and practiced usury as a matter of course and flagrantly. They were also, quote, much given to proselytizing, even by a sort of compulsion. Thus they would force Christian servants to be circumcised and urge their debtors, sometimes, to abjure Christ. But the biggest problem was usury. As in the rest of Europe, Christians in Spain were forbidden to take interest on loans, thus granting a monopoly to Jews for a practice which, over a relatively short period, could concentrate all the nation's capital in their hands. Usury was the interface with Christian culture which caused the most resentment. In 1326, the Aljama of Cuenca, considering the legal rate of 3 to 3 and a third percent too low, refused absolutely to lend either money or wheat for sowing. This caused great distress and the town council entered into negotiations resulting in an agreement by which the Jews were authorized to charge 40%. In 1385, the Cortes of Valladolid described one cause of the necessity of submitting to whatever exactions the Jews saw fit to impose when it says that the new lords, to whom Henry of Trastamara had granted towns and villages, were accustomed to impose on their vassals and starve and torture them to force payment of what they had not got, obliging them to get money from Jews, to whom they gave whatever bonds were demanded. Faced with either starvation or usury, the farmers and small businessmen of 14th century Spain chose usury and watched their prosperity drain into the hands of Jews. 
As later in Poland, Jews were also hated because they were tax farmers, which brought them into direct and unpleasant contact with a large number of Christians. The church tried to protect her flock from the predations of Jews involved in such activities by reminding rulers that canon law forbade employment of Jews in public office, but rulers, then as now, were too intent on short-term gain to consider the long-term consequences, which often swept them from their thrones. In 1366, Henry of Trastamara mobilized political resentment against Pedro the Cruel and created regime change in Aragon. When he marched into Spain with an army of French mercenaries, the Jews were the first to suffer. Thousands of Jews were slaughtered. Many more took refuge in Paris, where the same cycle of usury leading to resentment started again. As one of his first official acts, Henry released Christians in his realm from their debts to the Jews. It was undoubtedly popular, but short-lived. Henry soon realized that if the Jews were unable to extort usurious interest, they couldn't pay taxes or lend the king money. Jews also possessed indispensable financial and administrative skills. Henry, who ascended to the throne on a tide of resentment against the Jews, employed the same Jews to remain financially solvent and administer his realm. The cycle of exploitation leading to resentment continued towards social upheaval. The resentment against usury combined with the suspicion that Jews were thwarting the Reconquista by controlling the reconquered regions with the secret help of the Moors to cause the riots of the late 14th century. When the monarchs did nothing to curb Jewish influence, the outraged citizens took the law into their own hands. On June 9, 1391, the storm finally broke. The uprising in Seville sacked the Juderia and 4,000 Jews were killed. Those who were not killed saved their lives by submitting to baptism. The rioting then spread north, first to Cordova, then to Toledo and Burgos, until all of Castile was swept into the vortex of anti-Jewish violence. Once a Jew submitted to baptism, he could walk unharmed through the very mob which only minutes before was determined to kill him. The fear of reprisal created an unfortunate spate of forced conversions which compounded the problem of subversion that led to the riots and forced conversions in the first place. Unscrupulous politicians, seeing enforced conversion a quick fix to a difficult problem, ignored the warnings and created a deeper, more intractable problem. As the storm of anti-Semitism spread across Spain, small Jewish communities converted en masse. Given the forced nature of mass conversions of 1391, common rights, it was obvious that many could not have been genuine Christians. As a result, the conversos were regarded with suspicion as a fifth column within the church. Terms of opprobrium were applied to them, the most common being Murano. The regimen of false conversions in Spain made a bad situation worse. The cynical Jewish converts continued to exploit the situation under the protection of the church, while the sincere Jewish converts lived under constant and intolerable suspicion. By the 1440s, it was clear that forced conversions had not solved Spain's Jewish problem. According to the Acts of the Financial Administration of Castile, Jews controlled about two-thirds of the indirect taxes and customs within the country, on the frontier, and at the ports. A whole network of Jewish tax farmers and collectors was spread over the entire kingdom. Their chief was a Jewish tax farmer general who acted as the king's treasurer. The wholesale conversion, says Walsh, seemed to have given to this opportunist type of Jew a chance to eat his cake and have it too. He could enjoy all the advantages of going to mass on Sunday and going to the synagogue on Saturday. His children were barred from no profitable and honorable occupations. They could marry, thanks to his money, into noble, impoverished families, as they would do in England, and succeed to the proudest titles in Castile. They could become priests, even bishops. The suspicions fell most heavily on the cultured conversos of the upper class, who benefited most from conversion by gaining access to offices previously off-limits to Jews. The average Christian believed he was ruled by a class of philosophical intellectuals who were nihilists and opportunists, with no religious beliefs. Morals deteriorated at the court and the peasants groaned under their predations. This situation, Walsh says, could not go on indefinitely without an explosion and unfortunately there were many explosions of the worst possible sort. The mob, 
seeing the government of Enrique el Impotente, Henry the Impotent, unwilling to do anything to curb the conversos and virtually handing over to them the conduct of both state and church, took matters into their own hands. In one city after another, just before Queen Isabel came to the throne, the conversos were put to the sword and their houses burned. In 1453, after Constantinople fell to the Turks, the Christians feared a resurgence of Muslim influence in Spain, thwarting the Reconquista. In 1464, large numbers of conversos sailed for Constantinople, where they intended to revert to the religion of their fathers and give aid to the Turk Antichrist, who planned to march on Christian Europe and subdue it as the Moors had subdued Spain in the 8th century. Alfonso ascended the throne of Castile in 1467. When Alfonso entered Toledo in May of that year, open warfare broke out between the old Christians and the conversos. On July 2nd, a battle raged in Toledo for three days, during which four streets inhabited exclusively by conversos went up in flames. In 1469, Doña Isabella of Castile married Don Fernando, son of John II of Aragon. Ferdinand and Isabella tried to resolve the civil war that raged throughout Spain. The Jews were initially well disposed to the marriage. The Jews felt that a strong regime that maintained law and order would benefit them. But at least initially, Ferdinand and Isabella proved incapable of ending the civil war. There was also the matter of the Moors, who still occupied southern Spain, and who were suspected of being in league with the Jews. And there were also the recalcitrant nobles, who were law unto themselves, pillaging and plundering at will. Isabella needed to reimpose law in her kingdom, but she also realized that military conquest was necessary before that could happen. In July 1477, Isabella came to Seville. During her stay, which lasted until October 1478, she was subjected to the sermons of Fray Alonso de Hoyeda, the Dominican prior of Seville, who, quote, devoted all his energies to making the crown aware of the danger from Jews and false converts. The reports of Hoyeda and the Bishop of Cadiz convinced her nearly all converts were secretly practicing Judaism. Logic dictated that she could not rely on her courts because they were staffed by conversos. Isabella was convinced radical measures were necessary. The only suitable instrument was the Inquisition, a legal body whose judges would be Dominican monks, quote, carefully chosen and beyond the reach of intimidation or bribery. In 1478, she sent a delegation to Pope Sixtus to procure the necessary bull. Less than two years later, Muhammad II, head of the newly vitalized Turkish forces in the former capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, ravaged the coast of Apulia in anger after failing to take the island of Rhodes. On August 11, 1480, Muhammad took Otranto and immediately put half the population to the sword. The archbishop and his clergy were slaughtered after being tortured. When the news arrived in Spain in mid-September, the threat of the resurgent Turk convinced Ferdinand and Isabella they could no longer vacillate. The Spanish Inquisition came into existence when Ferdinand and Isabella were dealing with long-standing and seemingly intractable civil war and anarchy. The creation of the Inquisition is an indication they saw Jews and Judaizers as central to both the Muslim problem in the territory yet to be conquered and the problem of anarchy in areas under their control. When the victorious Spanish army marched into Malaga after the successful campaign to drive the Moors from Spain, they found 400 Jews living there. Virtually all were Judaized Christians who had fled the Inquisition from Spain to Granada where they reverted to Judaism. The apostates were ordered to decide whether they wanted to live completely as Christians or leave the country. Shortly after the royal couple entered Granada, they extended that option to all of Spain's Jews. On March 31, 1492, while still in Granada, Ferdinand and Isabella signed the edict expelling the Jews from the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. As before, Jews could convert and remain but the Inquisition had removed much of the incentive to convert. Large numbers chose to leave. Their experience in Granada convinced the monarchs that a total separation was the only solution to the Jewish problem they identified. For some indication of what might have happened in Spain if the situation there had gone unchecked, we need only look at Poland. Jewish influence over Polish political life increased in intensity, fueling Polish imperialism in the East, 
while weakening Polish rule at home. Polish laws codified Jewish hegemony over large areas of Polish cultural life. Since disobedience to the predations of the Jewish tax farmers was a capital crime, animosity against the Jews was widespread but severely repressed. Cultural drift in Poland led to an explosion of the sort the Inquisition prevented in Spain. As a result, the Polish Republic went into terminal decline, expiring 147 years later. By 1540, the Converso issue was over in Spain. Spain had saved itself by importing the Inquisition from southern France and then by exporting its problem to the north of Europe. Many of these Jews settled at Antwerp, a natural entrepot on the northern bank of the Scheldt River with easy access to the North Sea. Because of its location at the mouth of the Rhine Delta, Antwerp was the link between European markets and the colonies of the European countries were establishing throughout the world. Antwerp became the center for trade in East Indian spices and Brazilian sugar, and the agents for these firms were, almost without exception, Portuguese conversos, that is, Jews. Indeed, the wealthy trading firms were almost exclusively Portuguese New Christians. Antwerp became the center of a large mercantile network that included Jewish communities in Lyon, Ferrara, Rome, Turin, Venice, and Ancona, and extended to Ragusa, Salonika, and Constantinople in the eastern Mediterranean, and south to Suez and Cairo in Egypt, the line of the overland trade to the Indies. These Jews functioned as a sophisticated spy network that, quote, quietly kept the anti-Spanish, anti-Catholic forces of the world informed as to naval, military, and commercial happenings in the peninsula. The Jews who controlled the spice trade reinvested their profits in the new printing trade which they quickly used for cultural subversion and psychological warfare by printing Protestant Bibles. The printing business, combined with the intelligence network, gave the Jews and Protestants a significant advantage in the war with Spain. Thus the Jews, in the long run, took their revenge on the country that had cast them out. 